Okay, in this next video, we're going to explore in the Bohr atom how we can find its radius. And of course, that was back in the, about 100, 120 years ago, this was a very big challenge. How big is an atom? And of course, the size of the atom is determined by the radius of the orbit of the electron. So the first assumption was that they said, well, since the electron is like a point mass that goes around in a circle, it has angular momentum. And the definition of angular momentum is that it's equal to the moment of inertia I times the angular velocity omega. And for a point mass, I is, of course, mr squared, so L equals mr squared, and there's our r that we're trying to determine. And omega is, of course, v over r, v divided by r, so this r cancels out that r, and so we have L is equal to m r times v. Now they also assumed, since an electron is very small, that the angular momentum has to be quantized, that it can only exist in certain quantum states. And that would be, of course, determined by its, by its orbit around the nucleus. And assuming that there were different energy levels, different energy states that the electron could be at, so that there would be different places where the electron could exist, then the angular momentum then would change from one position to another position to another position in quantum states. Which means that the angular momentum for a um, for an electron was assumed to be some integer multiple of h bar. Now h bar is simply equal to h divided by 2 pi, so that's Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, and Planck's constant was determined to be the constant that determined the quantization of the universe. Any small particle will be quantized according to that particular constant, and Planck discovered that constant, so that's why it's now called Planck's constant, and so the assumption was that since we're going around the circle, and the circle involves 2 pi, that the quantization for the angular momentum was Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. They had a pretty good notion that would be the number. They used it and it turned out that was actually correct. Maybe they did a little bit of trial and error. Not sure if they did or not. All right, if that's true, what we can do and then is set this equal to that. So we can say that mrv is equal to n times h bar. And so if we solve this equation for v, we get v is equal to uh, n h bar divided by mr. All right, so now we have a relationship between the velocity of the electron and r. And of course, we don't know what the velocity of the electron is without knowing the radius, so we kind of have a little dilemma here. But then we can, of course, use the concept that since the electron is going around in a circle, that it feels the force of the proton pulling it inward, keeping it from going straight, following Newton's first law. So we then know that the Coulomb force, F, is a centripetal force, so F Coulomb equals F centripetal, and of course the Coulomb force is K times Q, Q over R squared, and that equals the centripetal force, which is MV squared over R, and of course the charges here is the uh, proton charge and the electron charge, we can just call it E, so this can then become KE squared divided by R squared is equal to MV squared over R canceling this r with that r, and solving that for v squared, we can then say that v squared is equal to k e squared over r times m. So here also we have a relationship between r, the radius, and the velocity, and then if we can somehow set these two equations equal to each other, we can eliminate v. Of course, to do that, we have to square this equation, so we have v squared is equal to n squared, h bar squared over m squared r squared, and if we set this equal to this, let's see what we get. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so we have uh, k e squared divided by r times m is equal to n squared h bar squared divided by m squared r squared. All right, now this r cancels out with that r, and now this whole equation no longer contains v, and it only contains r. And everything else should be known, k is a constant, h bar is a constant, n is just an integer, e is of course the charge of an electron, and m is the mass of the electron, which means we now have an equation that should allow us to find the radius of this atom. So now all we have to do is solve this for r, and so when we do that, we get r, when we bring this up here, equals n squared h bar squared. We still have an m squared in the denominator right here, and then we bring Oh, let's see here. We don't have to call it squared if we get rid of that. Notice that we have an m here and an m squared, so that cancels out. So we just have an m to the first power. The r is now up here, and the ke squared can come down here. So ke squared. So this should give us the radius 
of the hydrogen atom. All right, so I'm sure that when they get to this point, they must have been pretty excited. Now, of course, n is going to be 1 because we assume to be in the innermost uh, energy level. So this is going to be n1 squared times h bar, which is 1.055 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. Divide the whole thing by the mass of the electron, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Multiply that times k, which is 9 times 10 to the 9th. Uh, the units for k would be uh, newtons times, um, hmm, times uh, meters squared divided by coulomb squared. Okay, and then of course the electric charge would be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. That would be coulombs, and we also have to square that. All right, that should give us the radius. Are you getting excited? All right, so 1.055. Hmm, I think I made a mistake. Let me try it again. Okay, 1.055 e34 minus. And do we have to square that? Ha, huh, there's my error. I forgot to square that. No wonder I got the wrong answer. So I need to square that. All right. Divided by 9.11 e to the 31 minus. Divided by 9 e to the 9th. And divided by 1.602 to be completely accurate. Uh, times e to the 19 minus. And then we have to square that as well. And equals. And there it is. This is equal to 5.2. Three, round it off to two significant figures, times 10 to the minus 11 meters. And if you convert that to nanometers, that would be equal to 0.053 nanometers. And that is the Bohr radius. That was actually the way they calculated the radius of the hydrogen atom. And so now we can say that R is equal to 0.53 angstroms, or in nanometers, it's equal to 0.053 nanometers. That was that must have been pretty exciting when they were able to figure that out. All right, so now we know how to find the radius of the atom. Now when we come back we'll deal some more with the radius and the energy and some more examples in the future.